This morning I'd like to talk about the subject of, of unity. That, uh, you know, there's so much a divisiveness in our nation. And there's plenty of divisiveness to go along a long way in the church. Now, the only thing that you can usually do, you know, that this is certainly true when you're talking to individuals, when you're talking to couples, when you're talking to families, all they can do is what they can do for themselves and their families. And so that all, the only thing that we can do about unity is make sure that we're contributing to it, that we're a part of it. That we're doing something to promote it in, in our lives, in our relationships, in our church, and in our community. I trust that by the end of the message that you'll understand how important that unity is. And unfortunately, but it is a reality, how fragile unity is. You know, just speaking to the church, that, you know, that we divide over doctrine. The church is divided over race. This is the most segregated hour and a half of the week is Sunday morning. That you'll find that we're divided over economic issues, political issues, sometimes the color of carpet, pews or chairs, Denominational or non-denominational, we're divided over personality. We get divided over finances. There are far too many things to be divided over. But listen, let me pose what I believe is one of the great questions in the scripture that Paul asked the church in Corinth. And he says this, Is... Christ divided. Now mind you, I'm not one, and, and I want you to hear me clearly, I am not one that believes that you have unity at all expenses. See, because there are just some things you can't unite around. You know, somebody, you know, if, if one is not going to believe in the virgin birth, you can't unite around that. You understand. When you say unity at all expense, you know, if the, the, but when you're talking about the, you know, when you're talking about the church, we can unite around the fatherhood of God. The sufficient sacrifice of Christ on the cross being the only payment and atonement for sin. We can agree on his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Listen, you and I can differ about end times. We can differ about that. Truth is, and you know, the, the more agreement you have, the, the more strength you have. There are things that you, you, you can not be in unison about, but still walk together in unity. Again, Paul says, is Christ divided? Now, when he, when he speaks this, he's speaking to who? He's talking to the church. The church is the body of Christ. Is that not right? If you will, we are, uh, we, we are the body of Christ. We are the physical body of Christ on the earth today. Now he says, can the eye say I have no need of the hand? Or can the hand say I have no need of the arm? And he poses once again this question to you and I, is Christ divided? Now, if you were going to, if, if somebody in the congregation was going to do something, and, and, and let's just say they were just, you understand, if somebody was going to cut off their own foot, we would know they were a troubled person, wouldn't we? Now, would you agree with that, Landon? Yeah, somebody just said, well, I'm going to whack my foot off. You'd get seriously concerned about that. You'd say, there's something not right there. Yet we do that with one another. We do that with one another. We write one another off. And see, and the thing is, we don't see it as a body. We, don't, we say things, but we don't believe them. We do not see ourselves as a body. See, what you have to do is that many times you've got to get past the physical, and you've got to see the gift inside of somebody. Remember when Jesus went to his hometown? Oh, they said, oh, this is just Jesus, Joseph's son. 
Where does he come up with all these gracious things? Who's he to get up and say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor? They knew what he was saying when he said that. He's saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the anointed one, I'm the guy in the scripture. Who are you? They're ready to what? Write him off. We write one another off. It is done across the body of Christ. It, and again, and, and Paul poses the question, because he's struggling with it in his day, is Christ divided? So we don't see the uniqueness and the gifts. Sometimes you must look past somebody's humanity. You must look past, at times, their shortcomings. You say, well, Bill, uh, no, no, we don't look past people's shortcomings. Well, who made you judge and jury? Who art thou that judges another man's servant? Who art thou that judges another man's servant? And when you do speak to somebody, the Bible says you should. But go to them, but go, don't go to everybody else. Yeah. Don't go to everybody else. Is Christ divided? Now, mind you, I'm not necessarily picking on you. I'm picking on me. It's a message that fit anywhere. It's an issue in the church. Again, unity is, is such an important thing, yet it's such a fragile thing. And we don't understand the fragileness of it. And we don't understand the consequences of it when we do not maintain it. Paul says, is Christ divided? So let me give you reasons for, for unity. First of all, uh, let me say this. It was Christ's final prayer. It's a witness to the unchurched. We are the physical body. We are the physical expression of Christ in the earth today. That's who you are. Is Christ divided? And it does this. Your being right brings the Father no pleasure. Your being united does. Somebody say amen. Come on, get on board this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Get on board. Unity is such an important thing. See, if you had one last thing that you was going to pray for, the very last thing, if you knew you only had one more request to make before you was going to leave this world, what would that prayer be? Now, you think about the most important person who ever lived. He's not only man, but he's God. And the very last words that he utters in prayer, apart from being on the cross now, but when he's praying for his people, we find in John 17, 20 and 21, I do not only pray for these alone, so he's not only praying for his disciples, but he's praying for you and I, I but also on those who believe on me through their word, that you and me. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I'm not just praying for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Andrew and James. I'm not just praying for the, for, uh, for the twelve. Or the 12 minus 1 because we're, what Judas is going to do. But I'm praying for all those who are going to believe on me through their word. That they may all be what? Everybody say one. Say be one. See, we are one. We just don't believe it. The church doesn't believe it. There is only one church. There's not a white church and a black church. During the Civil War, here in Houston, Missouri, there was a North Methodist church and there was a South Methodist church. You think God was honored? I think not. It wasn't the only town. You saw that across the Midwest, these border states. They were very divided. He says that you may be one as you, as you, Father, you're in me and I in you, that they also may be what? One in us. That the world may, what, what's this? That the world may believe that you what? Have sent me. See, unity is the most effective. Said, I want you to get this. Unity is the most effective. Everybody say most effective. It is the most effective tool we have in reaching the unchurched. I'm going to tell you why lost people won't come to church. Because church people talk about the church and their friends in the church all week long. Somebody say amen or oh me. I didn't hear an oh me out there. I, I, I'm going to go on because I want to get the other stuff, okay? All right. It's the most effective tools that, that, that we have. First Corinthians 1, we ask the question once again, is, is Christ divided? 
Then we find this. His last prayer. And then it's, it's a pleasure to God. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Not in discord. You know, we're not trying to survive this fight. How good, how pleasant. Oh, the, the whole chapter is such a short chapter, but it's such a powerful chapter. It says it's like the oil that ran down on Aaron, that ran down his beard and, and onto his clothes. That oil was this, he was in being anointed to be a priest. The Bible says you and I are being kings and priests. Without unity, you can't function as a priest. Let's go a little further. Psalms 133. Now it says, listen to this. For there the Lord, what's he do? What did he command? Where does he command blessing? In unity. You get that? Where does the, now, now he doesn't want blessing. He what? He commands. But now when light be, what was? Light was. Isn't that right? He said, light be, light was. Why? Because he commanded it. When, but, I'm, again, I see reasons why the church, Leon, doesn't function in any more supernatural power. People say, where are the miracles? I don't believe in miracles. Well, I'm, miracles are still, they still happen. Well, they could happen. It could happen. You know, years ago, this really helped me. You know, years ago, I was, I was struggling, and people were teaching faith. And I was just a young Christian. And as a young Christian, people were teaching, teaching faith. And, and they were saying this, that, you know, that you know, to have something happen, you had to believe that you received when you prayed. And I just struggled with that. I know that's what the Bible said, but I still struggled with it. But then it dawned on me, well, that's what God said, and that's what he meant. Must be the way it is. And then I realized if, if I, I couldn't have got saved, how do you get saved? You believe in your heart. You say it with your mouth. You believe that you receive salvation. And you what? You get saved. You don't get saved just by joining a church or by how you get dipped or sprinkled. Another thing we get divided over, how you serve communion. I, once again, now, uh, what, how did you get saved? You get saved by believing in your heart. You say it with your mouth. You believe that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Salvation becomes yours. It's wonderful. But here was a thing that transformed my life as a young man that I understood that there was a part of faith that was personal responsibility. It was personal responsibility. You can, you can resist Christ and not get saved. You can resist forgiveness and not forgive. You can resist obedience and not obey. There was a personal responsibility. When, see, so when it, see, when it comes to blessing, does God want to bless? Oh, yeah, it's a settled issue. He wants to bless us. He blessed mankind when he created them. But he says, in the place of unity, there he what? He commands blessing, life forevermore. Mark 6, 5. Now, we have did this a few weeks ago, so I will spend very little time here. Notice there's two places called there. When we walk together, there he commands blessing. You see, an ex you see a dynamic expression of God. And see, and that's what we're all hungry for, is a dynamic exp expression of God. You know, you can go anywhere and get a little religion. Religion will not transform the world, but a dynamic expression of God changes the world. Yes. You find it throughout the Scripture. Now it says in Mark 6, 5, remember he went to his hometown, and that's where he, he got up and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, anointed me to preach the gospel, to heal the brokenhearted. Now they said they heard the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And it says, and they were offended at him. And then verse 5 says, now he could do no mighty work there. Two places called there. One place called there, it didn't, I, I'll remind you, it didn't say he would not. It said that he could not. It was a matter of personal responsibility. Where does the Lord command blessing? In unity. Where does he do no mighty work? 
and discord, division, and disunity. We go a little further. Now, worship. Man, you talk about guys. I love to worship. Look forward to it every week. I, do, I, I, I don't just wait until Sunday. I, I'm a person that worships throughout the week. I don't need a crowd to worship, but boy, I love worshiping together. Worship is the atmosphere that invites the presence, that invites God's presence. You believe that? I do. Yeah. He inhabits the praise of his people. Unity is the environment that commands blessing. Unity is the environment that commands blessing. Truth is, I'll make the case in a little bit, you'll find that you really can't enter into the right place of worship unless there is unity. Had somebody up here playing piano one time and I had a church member standing outside the doors waiting for them to get done so they could come in because they were offended. How well do you think that worship service went? Worship is the atmosphere that invites his presence, but unity is the environment that commands his blessing. Here's three things or four things about unity. Unity is willed by the Father. It's willed by the Father. It is modeled by the Son. It is produced by the Spirit. But here, remember that thing about personal responsibility? It is maintained by the saints. Willed by the Father, modeled by the Son, produced by the Spirit, and maintained by the saints. There will always be reasons to divide. There will always be personality conflicts. There will always be shortcomings in our lives. There will always be something to divide over. You must choose whether or not that you are going to understand how fragile unity is and how important it is. You and I are the ones that are going to determine whether or not that we're going to be in the place that God is going to command blessing or we're going to be in the place that he does just a few small works. Bible says he, lay hands on a, he laid hands on a few sick folk and healed them. He called that not a mighty work. That is a perfect picture of the church today. We get a few prayers answered here and there. And I believe it's directly connected to those two issues. The issue of discord, division, unforgiveness, and the issue of Unity. There the Lord, what? Commands. Blessing. So I believe that the, the success of the early church was based upon the unity that they had, but immediately it became a struggle. It is a struggle. It's real. We're not worse than any other generation, but we're not better than any other generation. Paul struggled with it in the early church. He says, it, again, he's posing the question, is Christ divided? I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas. He said, is Christ divided? I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Pentecostal. Well, I'm not even Pentecostal, I'm a Charismatic. I'm a non-denominational, I'm not none of y'all. You understand? We're Christ followers. Christ followers. There'll always be reasons to divide, but none of them will be as great as the reasons to unite. See, division is this. Division is a work of the flesh. If you can be divided, flesh has been, has been inserted. It just has. I can't help it. Paul and Peter had division. It was a work of the flesh. It took them years to get it right. So you understand, I, this is not an accusation. Everybody struggles with it. But I think, you know, we perish for lack of knowledge. I think sometimes when you see the thing that is most important and most valuable, you begin to, to raise the level of significance of what it means. This is not my notes, but then I'm going to get to it in a moment. But I'm going to tell you one of the things that unites people. You know, if you've got two pieces of iron, the only way to really connect those things permanently is through fire. If you work together in the midst of the fire... Remember the three Hebrew children? We, you know, no, no, who talks about Shadrach? Who talks about Abednego? 
Who talks about Meshach? Everybody says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you ever say their names one at a time except for reading them? No, you say the three Hebrew children, don't you, Dennis? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know why? Because they got in the fire together and they came through the fire and they are inseparable in history. See, if you'll labor through the difficult times in life, those things will unite you and bring you together. Families that go through a difficult time and survive the difficult time become inseparable in life, and the same is true within the church. But the church does not want to do the hard work to get through the difficult times, to get to the place that God commands blessing. Can you say amen? Amen. Division is a work of the flesh. Unity is a work of the Spirit of God. We just have to decide which we're going to follow. Forget your excuses. Forget your reasoning. Cast it aside. The truth is what the Word of God says, and it will never change. Can you say amen? Amen. Now listen, how do you build and maintain unity? If it is so important, you've got to know how to do it. How do we build and maintain unity? Here we go. First of all, you've got to strive for Christ-likeness. You strive for it. We're endeavoring to be more like Him. It is, our, it, it is our chief goal. I'm not trying to be the best Baptist I can be. I'm not trying to be the best charismatic I, I could possibly be. I, I'm not trying to be the best Methodist I can be. I'm trying to be the most Christ-like I can be. Aren't you? Isn't that right? I don't want to be a good Baptist, and I don't want to be a good Pentecostal. And I don't want to be a good Presbyterian. I want to strive for Christ's likeness. Look, look at here. See what the scripture says. All right. Now, Christ's likeness cannot be achieved. Now, listen to this. All right. Remember, we're talking about how important is this? You know, on the scale of 1 to 10, this thing's an 11. All right? Scale to 1 to 10, unity's an 11. And until you make it an 11, you're not, you're not going to have blessing commanded upon the things that you do. You've got to make it an 11. You don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, you know, I know people say, well, you can't give 110%. I'm being, ex- you don't understand you're making a, an expression that people get the significance of it, okay? Christ's likeness cannot be achieved without it. It can, it, and, it, or, and if, you can, if you can be Christ-like without unity, then the scripture's wrong and let's just quit. Let's just throw in the towel. But the scripture's right. And let's strive for it. And let's desire it. And let's sacrifice for it. And let's walk through the fire for it. Christ's likeness cannot be achieved without you know, Ephesians 4, 12 and 13. To pre- now, this is Paul says, to preparing God's people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach what? All right, so we're going to, this is what we do. We're continuing. Now, this was true in his day. They had not achieved unity of the faith. This is what I believe. Now, this is Bill. All right, this is what Bill believes. But you know, I'm often inclined to think I'm right. <laughs> no, I, I think I have scripture for it. That's just my being a little lighthearted. All right. I believe before Christ comes, the real church, the true church, finds unity of the faith. Now the early church, they started there as closely as you could, but you know that's how it is. You always start as close as you can. You'll never be any more pure than the day you got born again. Isn't that right? You start in a very good place. So in life, we're we're endeavoring to get to this place. Bring my underlines up if you you will. It says, until we come to the unity of the faith, now notice what's connected to it, and the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure. Now now notice, if you don't reach unity in the faith, you can't get the whole measure of Christ. Uh, Unity is what? It's just way up there. You can't, you, you can't afford to sacrifice it. Go a little further. To achieve unity, you have to do this. Real strong, grow up. Grow up. You know, if I miss and I didn't shake your hand, all right, grow up. All right, if, if, if we miss calling you at the church, Grow up. 
And you know, I got my own deals. Bill, grow up. Grow up, Bill. He said, you know, for, for us to become mature, and seeing that's what it means to mature, it means to grow up. Unity cannot be achieved. There is no, again, there's no spiritual growth. You see, everything is connected to this issue. There is no spiritual growth. Well, I'm just growing in my faith, and yeah, and you're just, you know, you're just a wrecking ball. And there's carnage everywhere you go. Grow up. If you have constant conflict, quit looking at other people and look at yourself. Yes, Somebody say amen. amen. All right. look, at, look at yourself and, and, and make a reasonable assessment. And if you have to ask God to forgive you and change, you do that and cooperate with Him. But you can. We all can. Again, these, these, are, these, are, the, these are the weightier matters. You know, there's the milk of the Word and then there's the meat of the Word. To achieve unity, you must be able to mature, to grow up. Now listen to this. You and I are responsible to make peace. Make peace. What was it, the Colt 45 they called a peacemaker? <laughs> well, it left a lot of people in its tracks, okay? We're not talking about that. We're not trying to wound and kill as many people as we possibly can. If we just beat this down <laughs> to just a few people, we'll be all right then. You and I are responsible to make peace. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the what? Ah, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a what? It's a peacemaker. It's a peacemaker. We're called to what? Make peace. For they shall be called, see that word sons? Two words in the New Testament that talk about being a son of God. One of them talks about just being a child, very immature. It's not that word. It's the other word. It's the word maturity. One who has an inheritance. Grown up. Full benefits. Blessed is the peacemaker. L listen to the Amplified Bible. Blessed. Spiritually prosperous are the makers and the what? Maintainers of peace. The what? The makers and the maintain. This is not God's job. This is your job. It's not my job. It's our job. Bless spiritually what? Prosperous. Remember, this is the place he what? He commands blessing here. This is where the benefit of God comes into your life. You know, the Bible says, those that, are, those that are mature among you, let them restore such a one when he's offended. Let them restore them. See, our ability to be able to restore people once they've been broken or hurt or have fallen is a measure of the church's maturity. Those are the what? The sons of God. They're what? They're peacemakers. Blessed, spiritually prosperous are the makers and maintainers of peace. They shall be called the sons of God. Now, some people make some people make excuses, some people make trouble. It should say but. But sons of God make peace. But sons of God make peace. If you're taking a picture of one that you're going to post, don't do that one. <laughs> we had a lot of technical problems this from <laughs> I won't tell you all of them. Uh, let me tell you this, know who not to be united with. You said, well, B, you're talking about unity. Oh, yeah. And there's some people that are never going to be interested in unity. They are divided. They are divisive. They do not want to go the same way. They're not trying to be more like Christ. Know who not to be divided. United with. Romans 16, verse 17. Stay away from those who cause what? Divisions. Stay away from those who cause divisions. That's not what I said. That's what the Apostle Paul said. We believe the scripture is given and written by the inspiration of God. We believe it's divinely inspired. Stay away with those who cause division. Look what Alexander the Great said. Remember, Upon the conduct of each depends the fate of all. 
The conduct of each depends the fate of all. Now, while Alexander the Great would never be quoted as a theologian, he was a great leader. And that's a very true statement. So our inability to be able to find unity in the church today, the divisiveness. And this is something, it's not new for me. I've strove for unity all my life. There's rarely a pastor who comes through Texas County that I don't become a very good friend with. I don't care where they pastor. I don't care if they're young or if they're old. I care about them. I hurt when they hurt. I bleed when they bleed, and I rejoice when they rejoice. Like everybody, I have had conflict with ministers. But as much as it depends upon me, I'm going to walk in peace with all men. I want them to be my friends. We want these churches in Texas County to be our sister churches. Amen. We are not competing with anybody. We never want to grow at somebody else's expense. We, never want to, we would never want to rejoice that if we were doing well and somebody else was, was not doing well, they were failing. Why? Why? Because the conduct of each depends the fate of us all. It's never a healthy church when there's one strong church in a community or two strong churches. The healthier the churches, the better off everybody is. Why? Because the conduct of each depends the fate of all. A fifth point. Restore and be restored quickly. Amen. Now again, I'm talking to you about unity. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about if there's something that you need to be fed up with, and that's division. If there's something that we must look past sometimes people's flesh and look into the gift of God that is in their life and the asset that they are to the kingdom, it's the day and time that we live in. When we sow grace, we reap grace. When we sow mercy, we reap mercy. See, here's the deal. If enough of that was sown, we'd have such a big crop, it would overcome those other things. Restore and be restored quickly. Ephesians 4, 3. Alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. Alert at noticing differences, quick at mending fences. Matthew 5, 25, come to terms quickly with your enemy before it's what? Oh, folks, and there are times it's too late. I've suffered too late before. And you know what? Too late never quits costing. Too late never ends being painful. Too late never ends being hard. Hard continues. Hurt continues. Come to terms quickly with your enemy before it's too late. Now, look, I want you to catch the gravity of that verse. This is talking about who? Who's it say? Who will come to terms with quickly, Linda? With who? Who's, what's it say up there? With who? Your, your enemy? Then think about what you ought to be doing with your friends. If you're to come to terms quickly with your enemy, what should you do with your friends? Oh, yeah. A little further. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift. What are we talking about here? We're talking about unity. And we're talking about worship. The altar is a place that you come to worship. So, if you bring your gift, let's say you bring your sacrifice of praise, and you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift, your sacrifice of praise, at the altar, and go your way, see this word? I didn't have enough time. I would like to have spent time focusing on this. Say that word. Say it again. The Bible says, here's everybody's ministry. You have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That is bringing two broken parts back together again. 
Unity, listen to this. You want to write something down? Write this down. Unity is more important than worship. (laughs) Unity is more important than worship. See, because the absence of it inhibits our ability to worship God in the manner that, that, that He would want. So first be what? Reconciled to your brother. Now, this is not that He... Remember, He inhabits the praise of His people. This is the thing that creates atmosphere. But you don't have the environment. First be reconciled. And I I can always hear the wheels are turning, people are thinking. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. I don't want to... You know, in a moment like this, you know, God could do more than my ranting. First be reconciled to your brother, to your sister, to your husband, to your wife, to your neighbor, to your pastor. And then come and what? And offer your gift. Again, I remind you that we are to to do what? Restore and be restored quickly. How good, how pleasant. Isn't Isn't that right? How good, how pleasant. See, these are the words of a shepherd. How good, how pleasant. One of the things that is very disruptive if, you, if you're raising sheep is, is if, that there's, if they're stirred up all the time. And you know what they'll do? You know, and, and if one gets out, another will get out. And then another get out. Because the truth is, a, a shepherd has to herd the sheep. Sheep end up following sheep. It's not right, but it's what many do. It's true in nature, it's true in the church. This issue of unity is such an important thing. Here's the place that God wants to, just think about this, God wants to command blessing on you. He wants to get us out of that place called there where he couldn't, not, not wouldn't, but couldn't do any mighty work. He wants us out of that place. He wants us into this other place called there. How good, how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the oil that ran down Aaron's beard. He's being anointed to what? To be a priest, to represent God to the people and to represent the people to God. This is why you don't need a man to go before you. This is why you don't have to tell your sins to someone else. Because you're what? You're a priest. Boy, he wants that anointing. That oil that is rubbed in, smeared over. It's like the, the, the prophet said, it's the balm of Gilead. It's, it's, it's the oil that heals. Unity, once again. It is one of our greatest needs. It is fragile. We must be willing to sacrifice something to have it. What costs us so little, we value so cheaply. But that which costs you much, you will value much. This is the thing that is worth costing you much. It is the thing that the church in such need of is unity. Every head bowed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Christ to come into your heart, we'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. We're going to pray. We're going to invite everybody in the room to pray. If you've gotten away from the Lord, would you pray with us also? You said, Bill, I've known the Lord, but I've wandered from Him. Would you be reconciled to Him? Would you allow us as a church to be an ambassador of reconciliation this morning and pray together with us? And then when I close, I'm going to pray another prayer at the end of that prayer. And and if you need forgiveness, would you ask the Lord to forgive you and reconcile you to somebody? And would you make sure that that gets restored?
Father in heaven, we come before you. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that He lived. I believe that He died. I believe He died for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life. Old things are passed away. Old sin, old hurts, and old habits. Thank you for a brand new heart and a brand new beginning. You're my Lord, and I am your Savior. You're my Savior. Jesus, you're my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you might be here this morning and say, Bill, I've, I've certainly got broken areas in my life, and I've, I've got hurt. You don't understand the hurt I've been through, and I, I would say I believe you. Or you don't know the hurt I've witnessed, and I would say, ah, you're right, and I believe you. I would just say that do everything that it can as it depends upon you to, to walk peaceable. To love and to forgive and to restore. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I need you. I need your strength to be able to walk with parts of the body of Christ. I need to be able to walk through the fire with them. I want to be at the place that you command blessing. Lord Jesus, if I've erred, forgive me. But Lord, where those have erred in my life, or toward those that I love, would you forgive them? Would you unite us? Will you help make me more Christ-like? Would you help us to become more Christ-like? Father, I thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen.